This is the fourth Sunday of Advent when we think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary is the God of Mary. And she's crucial for our story of salvation. And today we honour her. Here's a prayer written in the third century in Egypt. Beneath your compassion, we take refuge, O oh God, there. Do not despise our petitions in time of trouble. Rescue us from dangers, only pure, only blessed. Amen. Lighter candle to love in all those long to love. And we light a candle for joy where joy is absent. Today we light a candle for peace. Say together, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In the dawning and the ending, there is hope. In the anger and the conflict, there is prophecy. In denunciation and accusation, there is John the Baptist. And in the denunciation and proclamations, there is Mary. And for the last weeks we've been doing this little action prayer, which is simply to move our hands into a cup and look into the hands and say, Jesus be with us, be here now. Jesus, be here now. Be here now. Be here now. Come, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. So a very warm welcome to church this morning. I thought we would be few because of the situation. We were scheduled to have our community choir, Union Chapel Singers, coming to sing for us this morning but we thought it wasn't very wise to have a large group of people singing because the virus is airborne and that would put people at risk. And our organist, Anthony, has uh, tested positive for uh, COVID. So we're going to have a shorter service, which I think is right, actually, in, in the situation, um, so we can keep uh, Keep, be careful of each other and we won't have coffee after the service as we, we have been doing um, just so that we can keep ourselves safe. Uh, these are very challenging times uh, and I think we all have to be extremely careful of each other uh, and it feels somehow that the, the church's big celebration is muted this year. Uh, but the truth of the story is that Jesus came in a difficult time. Jesus came in a in circumstances which were extremely challenging. And whilst we 
hope to find Jesus in the joy of the celebration. It may be that we're more likely to find him in this time of crisis and more likely to find him in the quiet of this place. So I hope that this service enables us to still get a sense of the birth of Jesus as being something that is the hope for the world, our world, and our time here and now. So, no music, but lots of thoughts, lots of silence, and lots of opportunities to welcome Jesus into our hearts. We have our first reading. Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem, the Frontrier, who have come from the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of the kindreds shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall be secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. If the Assyrians come into our land and tread upon our soil, we will raise against them seven shepherds and eight installed as rulers. This is a poem by Carol Ann Duffy called Bethlehem. A mild dusk, the little town snaked on the edge between desert and farmland. Camel prints in the sand. Like broken hearts, the call and response of sheep among dry shrub. To the west, the whispering prayer of olive groves, incense and rosemary, cedar, pine, votive on purpling air. Everyone there who had to be there. The lamps lit, or Bethlehem full. Every cave stabled with beasts jostling for hay in the fusty gloom. Every room, peopled and packed from raft to floor, barley bread in the ovens rising, and a girl's hands at an open door, her blade harping on a pomegranate, its blood on her pale palms. A voice from an alleyway chanting. Psalm. The moon rose, the shepherd sprawled, short, a rough ring on sparse grass, passing the leather flats. From the town, a swelling human sound, cooking smells fading the hour, as lambs and fishes spat in the fires. A hundred suppers, honey, fig, olive, cream, set before stone cutter, potter, tent maker, maid, nurse, father, and child. Young wine in the old jars, yellow and cold. The inn bulged, travellers boozed, bawled, bragged, swapping their caravan tails, money lenders biting their gold coins, painted women dancing on tables, mules grayed outside in the stable, the youth in the courtyard strummed on a harp. The sweating innkeeper shouted and served. His wife counting the heads, then making up beds on the flat roof in the vine-covered yard. Above, bright views in the sky arrived. A star. The small hours, all living souls slept, or half slept. The night fire smouldering low out in the scrub. The olive oil cooling in clay lamps. A goat herd snored in the straw between two goats. Silent night. The soft breeze from the desert laying a dusting of sand on the dark road, blessing the homes. A donkey's slow, delivered hooves on the stones. 
Afterwards, the witnesses spoke of a singing boy, an angel, walking the fields in the hour before dawn, winged in his own light, of how the shepherds fled from the sight, lambs in their arms. And some swore on their lives, on their children's lives, that they saw an olive tree turning to pure gold, that the moon stood low to gape at the world. What certain time and place heard three crows from the cock singing a stable behind the inn. Present, animals, goat herd, shepherds, innkeeper, wife, and then the small war cry of a new life. Wise men sway on camels in the east. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 55. Two beautiful, famous passages in the book. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child wept, leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child of my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of the servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength in his arm. He has scattered the crowd in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped to serve Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Let's pray. later just explain that uh, we were due to have uh, Union Chapel singers this morning but because of the COVID situation we thought it better not to have that and our organist is struck down with COVID so uh, we have a quiet service with, with our music this morning. If you think about the two central male characters in the early part of the Christmas story Zechariah is told of the birth of John the Baptist, and then he's struck dumb. And we don't hear Joseph speak. We only get to hear of his dreams. Mary and Elizabeth, on the other hand, are articulate, poetic, and their words have become essential parts of our Christmas tradition. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus Christ. And Mary's song, the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, is spoken and sung every day on churches, monasteries, and cathedrals across the world. I saw a tweet from a, I saw a tweet from a desperate mother. She had heard that whoever is chosen to play Mary in the school nativity play goes on to have a successful career.
career. She had just heard that her child had landed the part of the eighth shepherd. There's no way around the simple fact that Mary is a central figure for Christians and a Christian story. And I know that as I speak, there are former ministers, deacons, church members of this church who are spinning in their graves at the very suggestion of this hint of papery, but let them spin. For Mary is one of a long line of matriarchs and prophets in the Bible. Eve, Sarah, Miriam, Deborah, Judith, Esther, Naomi, Ruth, and the countless unnamed women prophets. We read in the book of Joel, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Mary is known in Greek as the Articles, the one who gives birth to God. She is God's chosen person to bring about God's way of saving the world, to recreate it and renew it. The implication that she is a sort of vessel and means to an end. But Mary is Mary. She's a person in her own right. It's hard to imagine her life. She was young, probably around 13 years old, when she became pregnant. She may have been, according to tradition, brought up in the temple of Jerusalem, and tradition has it that she was a weaver working on the veil which separated the sacred holy of holies from the rest of the temple. In the Gospel of Luke, we read how Mary is visited by an angel who announces her pregnancy. And when this happens, she is about her business in the Nazareth home. Just like the Old Testament prophets, her call is unexpected. She feels herself unworthy. And again, just like the Old Testament prophets, she succumbs to God. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And at the same time, her cousin, Elizabeth, has also become pregnant. Elizabeth's story mirrors that of two other women in the Bible, Sarah and Hannah, who both had pregnancies in old age and had the stigma of childlessness removed. And as we join the story in this morning's reading, Mary goes from her home to visit the older, wiser woman. She seeks out someone who knows what it is like to have a whispering campaign about her. Mary may well have noticed the silences as she walked into a room and the disapproving looks as she walked through her village. Mary needed Elizabeth. And Elizabeth needed. And Elizabeth was glad to see Mary and saw something very special in her. Not only the child in her womb, but also her personality, her being. She speaks the prayer which has resounded in the church ever since. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of you. She calls Mary the mother of my Lord. And this is the first time we hear this familiar title for Jesus, Lord. Lord, have mercy. The cry of anxious believers resounding through the church ever since. Lord, a breath prayer that comes in handy whenever we're in need. Lord. And Mary's response is also one of the great hymns of the church, the Magnificat. It begins with praise, my soul magnifies the Lord. She acknowledges that she has plenty of reason to give thanks to God. It isn't just that she's been chosen for this special divine purpose, but that she has been chosen because of her ordinariness. 
She's not a megastar, a renowned beauty, a wealthy, successful entrepreneur. She's just Mary, humble, lowly, unimportant, living in an obscure village away from the capital and the buzz of urban life. And she praises a powerful God, a God whom she calls the Mighty One. This God shows strength with his arms. She speaks of a warrior God who scatters the proud and brings down the powerful from their thrones. And she contrasts this powerful God with the God who stands on the side of the poor. For the God who puts down the mighty lifts up the humble and meek. The God who sends the rich away empty, fills the hungry with good things. God remembers to be merciful even when exercising judgment on the power. This little encounter between two women reveals so much about the God we serve. They're both beneficiaries of God's grace and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they recognize God at work in their lives. They see God at work in the big picture, in the grand scheme of things. It was the Protestant theologian Karl Barth who said that Mary was a first disciple. Elizabeth also was a first disciple. So while we tell stories of Jesus and his twelve male disciples, we forget that it was two women who said yes to God long before Jesus walked on the shore of Lake Helen just as the women at the tomb and another man were first to bear witness to the resurrection. These two strong, faithful women are models for our faith. And theirs is not a faith for the faint-hearted, nor for anyone who think that God is the protector and defender of the status quo, all of the structures of the world as we know them. We need to draw upon and live faith of Elizabeth and Mary, their humble obedience to the call of God to be different in the world, to live with different values, perceptions and readings of the meaning of history and happenings in history. There is a great gospel song from Jamaica which goes, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other, but Jesus is the way. It's a simple statement of faith. At first, it sounds arrogant and oppressive, but it does not say that the church is the answer, or that Christianity is the answer, or even that we have the answer. It's not an assertion of dominance, but of humility. Jesus is the answer. This little babe in a manger is the answer. And this is so important for a world dominated by oppressive powers. It matters so much in a world that is paralyzed by fear of the virus, climate change, and massive insecurity. Jesus is the answer. But Elizabeth and Mary saw that Jesus was a gift from God. The child in Elizabeth's womb jumped for joy encountering the expectant Mary. Elizabeth and her unborn child knew that Mary's boy child would transform the world. And that is the invitation we are given. To leap with joy at the possibility that things can and will change for the better. To leap with joy at the idea that God's judgment is on the powerful and that God's mercy is on the humble, the weak, the oppressed, the repressed and the depressed. Maybe our Christmas festivities will be a little muted this year. Maybe the overindulgent Christmases of past days are a thing of the past, as the world adapts to a new order, as nature fights back against an abusive Yet the invitation to respond to God's birth in human form remains as vital today as it was in those Judean homes 2,000 years ago. 
Mary's yes to the angel drew her into a story in which earthly values were put into reverse. The world today needs upside down values of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Elizabeth's wisdom came from the workings of the Holy Spirit and her own experience of exclusion. This deep wisdom is the wisdom we urgently need today. We just need to look at life differently. I hate going to the auditions. Firstly, you have to go through the eye test, and they never tell you whether you get it right or not. And then you have to choose new frames. But of course, you have to try them. Try them on to see whether they suit you or not. But you, when you do that, you don't have your own glasses on. So in my case, I can't actually see whether or not the glasses suit me or not. So for the past few times, I've just said, I'll keep these, rather than admit that I can't tell what the new ones will look like. The Gospel is different. We need to read the Christmas story with the courage to try something new. It's not merely a commemoration of a historic event. It's not a retelling of a children's story so that the bright kid can be married and forge a successful career. It is looking afresh at the world. Once the new lens has arrived, you can see things more clearly and the headaches disappear. The birth of Jesus tells us to look out with new lenses. Someone once told me that if you're in intimidated by someone you are in awe of, or somebody in authority who you are in awe of, just imagine them in their underwear. Boris Johnson, Vladimir Putin, President Xi Jinping, Joe Biden, Nigel Farage. Works, doesn't it? It cuts them down to size, but unfortunately, it also puts it off your lunch. Both Mary and Elizabeth are women who see that God is not at work in the powerful elites or in the successful high achievers. God is at work lifting up the lowly and the meek. God is at work where the refugee is protected, where the vulnerable are cared for, where people who are whispered about and regarded as unacceptable find community, resilience and strength, where the unjust Resistant. God is at work. Amen. Let us just spend a little bit of time in prayer together. be to us, Lord, according to your word. We give thanks once more for the story of the birth of Jesus, for the faithfulness of Mary, his mother, and for the example that she gives to the world. power for the good of people and not for personal aggrandizement. We pray for an end to the corruption which devils our world. And that we cease to value wealth over well-being. And that we treasure the things of God over the things of the world. Pray, Lord, for all facing hardship this Christmas. Whether it is because of insecurity of home or income, or those who 
those who live with tensions in their families seem to be exacerbated by the onset of the Christmas season. And we pray as we are once again challenged by the pandemic. We pray for all affected all who care for the sick, all who are worried, for anyone who is especially vulnerable. And we pray for countries across the world who have not been afforded the privilege of vaccinating. Pray for our loved ones, especially those who are distant from us and whom we will miss over the festive season. We bring to God in the quiet of our hearts any whom we have a special need to pray this morning, any who we are particularly concerned about. We pray for those we have known and loved who have died. Pray that they will rest in God's love as they remain close in our own hearts. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary's simple response to the angel. Let it be. as we face anxieties and stresses and worries for our country and our world, let us just put our trust in God, put our hope in God, our faith in God and the things of God and the way of God shown to us through Jesus Christ. Quiet of our hearts, just say, Let it be. Let it be to me, according to your word. Calming our fears, quietening our doubts, enabling joy of new birth to become part of us, allowing ourselves to say yes to God, as Mary simply said, let it be to me, according Whatever comes, let it be. And together we pray the words of that infant child born in Bethlehem, who grew to become our Saviour, our teacher, our friend. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead 
us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. a short service because we should have a short service during the, um, this period of the pandemic and this very, very worrying situation um, and that has led us to make some decisions and then the worst one that we have to make was to cancel our carol service this evening. Um, that was 75% of our singers now tested positive. So uh, we, we, we are finding ourselves in, found ourselves in a situation where two reasons. One is that fewer and fewer of us were able to take part, and the other reason, of course, is that infections in this area of London are high, very, very high. So we don't want to be responsible for uh, a large event which, which would uh, cause people to, to catch the virus. On Christmas morning, we're going to not have a service here for the same reason because I think the virus will have spread even more by then. Uh, but we will have a service online. So if you go and please do this on Sunday morning, on uh, Christmas morning, there will be a service on our home page of our website on YouTube that you can follow and look at. So if everybody just does that, then in some way the ether would have been together for our Christmas morning. Service. It is the most, the second most important day of the church's year, so please do that. And then uh, on the beginning of January, uh, we put it on our website, we'll have a, a communion service put on Zoom. And then hopefully, hopefully, by the second week of January, we'll be able to, to resume our, our services again. But we are just really conscious that we have to be very responsible, and even though we would love to have our Christmas event and services, we just feel we have to be very careful. Um, having said that, I do want to wish you a happy Christmas. And uh, I do hope you have the opportunity to at least meet with people, or some people. Uh, it will be muted as Christmas has gone, uh, but, you know, in a way it's not such a big hardship considering what many other people across the world have to endure. So, so we just hope you have a good Christmas and the opportunity to, to meet with family if you are able. Let's close with a, a blessing. God of hope, who brought love into this world, be the love that dwells between us. God of hope, who brought peace into this world, be the peace that dwells between us. God of hope who brought joy into this world, be the joy that dwells between us. God of hope, the rock we stand upon, be the centre, the focus of our lives, always and particularly this Advent time. And the blessing of the God of Sarah and of Abraham, the blessing of the Son born of Mary, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit, who broods over us as a mother with her children, be with us now and evermore.